yeah. And the, the coping mechanisms, you know, for athletes or anybody interested in, in, in high performance, it seems to be um, not as well understood as, as some other interventions. And, but, you know, my understanding is that it's a variety of psychological and physiological coping mechanisms that people could use to sustain their performance over extended periods if it's endurance. And the mechanisms can help the mental and physical stressors encountered during the event, whatever the event may, may be. And, you know, those stressors could be fatigue or discomfort or, you know, a range of other emotions that, that come with it. Can, can you talk to us about some of the coping mechanisms that athletes or people who are interested in, in just, you know, being able to bring their best version of themselves to whatever they do that they could practice? And um, I, I know we touched briefly on mental imagery and visualization uh, and familiarization. Are they the type of techniques that you think can help people cope or having coping mechanisms in, in different environments? Yeah, well, they are like vi visualization and uh, those type of things are really, really beneficial. But there are there's a suite of them, like there's numerous ones. And through the research that I did with Decca Ironman and through the research I did for my PhD as well, those tools such as I'll give you an example of a few of them. But basically, I when I'm working with clients, I give them I go through uh, options of those suites uh, of those tools. And basically, they choose the ones that work for themselves. And right. there are tools that will work for some athletes and some that I use myself. You would say, oh, Junior, that wouldn't be great for me because some people are more visual and some people aren't. But like the things like association and dissociation as an example. So association would be and I use this during the row. So if I was tired or if I was just trying to stay awake or if I was nervous or if the seas were really big around me and I needed to refocus, I'd use associative tendency so, or strength strategy so I'd be totally and utterly 100% concentrating on what my rowing stroke was doing so yeah. what are my what's my leg action doing what are my arms doing my performance what was my heart rate doing was if I'm on the bike what's my cadence doing am I getting optimal performance from my mm. technique so mm. that's really the associative thing is really focusing in on yourself mm. and um, I imagine myself as a unit as an engine and so that engine how is it performing does that make right. sense it does yeah, yeah and then the dissociative end of things is the distraction so you're purposefully distracting you're purposefully taking yourself away from that situation and thinking something else so i might uh, ask people to think of themselves on a desert island or think of themselves on their honeymoon or mm -hmm. writing a book or trying to plan something and i think one of the dissociative things that works really well and i use it all the time myself and a lot of my clients would use it and i learned this from one of the deck ironmen actually and uh, it is I used it in or going over the Sierra Nevadas this summer. So as, if I was going up a very steep hill and it was very, very hot, I would keep pedaling, right? So you're keeping pedaling, but all the time you're saying to yourself, okay, you basically put yourself into a, an, imaginated, or an imagination frame of mind. And mm. I'd imagine myself getting off the saddle and mm. very, very vividly getting off the saddle. Now I'm still pedaling, getting yeah. off the saddle, uh, stopping, looking around, feeling the heat, just sort of cooling down, taking mm. a deep breath, opening a can of Diet Coke, pouring it into ice so you're hearing the sounds, tasting the senses, feeling yeah, the smells, yeah. hearing the bubbles and take as long as you can and then yes. build in all the other things around you and then get back up on the bike again and then start pedaling again for real mm. and you actually do feel energised and you're mm. almost at the top of the hill and it really, mm. really makes a difference. And mm. uh, Like that example or other people that were going up K2, if they were cold in the tent at night, they'd imagine themselves, they'd visualize themselves at that time eating hot stew at home or drinking yeah. hot soup. Stuff that really, comfort foods or stuff that they were familiar yes. with or they yeah. loved, you know, having. Does that make sense? It does make sense, yeah. I, and why does it work? And um, I, I know, like, to some degree, we're playing tricks on the mind and we're probably breaking the association we have with pain or discomfort which creates then some type of physiological impact on the body you know that if we think this is really difficult and we may not make it to the top of the mountain 
and if we kind of give our attention to that and rest with it, it actually compounds the, the, the fatigue or the difficulty with the disassociation. It creates some type of gap, Karen, I assume, for your mind to sort of say, this isn't as bad as you think it is. There's something else there that we can lodge in between you and the discomfort. And something happens in that gap just to give you that little bit more. It doesn't sound, for instance, like a flow state that you may get from visualization at times. It's, it's more of it changes your context. Yeah, I think what it does, like the, the brain and the body, as we know, is so interlinked. Like it's, mm. it's a holistic unit. It's one unit. Yes. And I think so many times we're our own, we're the, des- we're the guiders of the destiny of our brain and so, uh, for everything really, you know, within reason.